America's airborne anti-hero, Jake McNasty McNeese. Honestly, can't wait to jump into this video. Before we do, I appreciate if you guys can hit that subscribe button down below. I'm also posting extra content to my Patreon page. Link is in the description. But yeah, let's get straight into this, man. This is hands down going to be the longest video I've ever made. I should probably pee first. Hold on. <laughs> hey, what? <laughs> Today we're talking about America's airborne anti-hero, ladies and gentlemen, James Elbert McNeese, aka Jake McNasty, uh -huh. the leader of one of the most notorious military groups of all time, the Filthy 13. Oh, badass name. And just to clarify, in case you don't know, being an anti-hero is not a bad thing, despite how it may sound. You see, the textbook definition of an anti-hero is a hero that does not display typical heroic qualities, which honestly is pretty ambiguous, but okay. it's one of those things where you know it when you see it. So for example, a regular hero would be somebody like Superman. He's invincible, <laughs> he shoots lasers from his eyes, and he always does the right thing 100% right. of the time. He right. never roughs up the bad guy. He always takes him straight to jail because the justice system never messes up anything. He only has sex in the missionary position. He always changes the batteries in his smoke detectors on time. It's boring, unrelatable, and completely inhuman behavior. Right. Uh-oh. Anyways, and then you have the anti-heroes, the fan favorites, the characters with human faults that they not only overcome, but turn into their advantage. Characters like Wolverine with his bad attitude, Deadpool with his morbid sense of humor. Oh, okay. I didn't really know. Yo, his definition for everything is perfect. Yo, I'm more into anti-heroes than actual heroes, bro. I, I, I prefer the anti-ones. Hell, even Batman is an anti-hero because at the end of the day, it's more relatable to do karate in your garage, dress up like a bat, and then run around town beating up clowns True. and dudes on steroids than it is to be perfect. Yep. Superman. So I guess what it means to be an anti-hero is that you always do the right thing, but you don't always do it the right way. Right. And if you were to ask me for a real life example of an anti-hero, I can't give you a better one than Jake McNeese. All right, here's the deal. Jake was born in Oklahoma this is gonna be good. in 1919. He grew up during the Great Depression as one of 10 siblings. This guy had to learn how to hunt, fish, and trap just to help put food on his family's table so they could survive. He had Yo, his first full-time job when he was 10 years old ten. and continued to work full-time all the way through high school. After graduating, he became a full-time firefighter. Shortly after that, the attack on Pearl Harbor happened. America entered World War II. Jake, however, was exempt from the draft because he was a firefighter, but that's not what Jake okay. wanted. Jake wanted to volunteer here, and he didn't just want to volunteer for anything. Jake wanted to be a paratrooper and a demolition man. Jake wanted to jump what is a demolition man? out of a perfectly good plane behind enemy lines with a couple of buddies, be completely surrounded and have nothing more than a gun and some explosives and just go out there and deprive the enemy of nice things. Oh, he's ready, bro. He's ready. Got a bridge? Guess what? Now you don't. Nice power lines. It'd be a shame if somebody blew those up. That's what Jake wanted to oh. do. And that's what he was going to do. So at the age of 22, Jake set off for training. Upon arriving at training, Jake pretty much immediately establishes himself at being incredible at any task the army can throw at him. Yo, that has to, demolition, man, that has to be one of the most riskiest jobs. Like you're just going straight into enemy lines and like destroying the stuff around you. Bro, that's risky, man. But also a humongous pain in the ass to his entire chain of command. During his very okay. first week in the army, Jake got in a fist fight with the staff sergeant in charge of the chow hall because the staff sergeant wouldn't give him butter with his bread. At which <laughs> point, the entire chain of command is like, on one hand, we have to get rid of this guy. He's a loose cannon. You absolutely cannot be attacking staff sergeants as a private. He's got to go. But on the <laughs> other hand... This is exactly the type of behavior we're looking for, for somebody that we want to drop behind enemy lines and expect to fuck up everything. True, so they just kind of let it slide. Fast forward a couple of weeks, Jake is doing a demolition course and he ends up setting the course record. He is the fastest person to ever complete this course. Ah, he's At which good point, then. his leadership walks up and is like, hey, soldier, congratulations, you broke the record. Jake looks the guy in the eye and goes, yeah, if you think that's impressive, you should see what I can do when I have some butter once in a while. <laughs> and that pretty much sets the tone for the rest of Jake's training. He Yo, imagine. Imagine being a guy that you just smacked your superior, right? They would not allow that. And they allowed it? Imagine being that guy. He absolutely crushes any task they give him. But also, Jake does not give a single fuck about the dog and pony show that is the U.S. military. He's not right. going to call an officer sir or ma'am. He's going to call them by their nickname. He's not going to salute them unless they salute him first. He's not going to stand outside and salute the flag during retreat. And he absolutely is not going to show up to formation on time. And he's definitely not going to be sober 
all the time because what? that's just how Jake is. And because of this, Jake would be the only new recruit to not get promoted to PFC, which is a way bigger deal than it sounds like because at this point in time in the 101st Airborne and the 82nd Airborne, every single new recruit after 31 days of training got promoted to private first class. The okay. reasoning behind that was they wanted to give these guys a promotion so they can make more money and ideally send that money back home to their families because, well, They've got a very dangerous job coming up, and nobody knows what's going to happen. That's so cool to do that. Absolutely everybody is getting promoted to PFC after 31 days, Over that Jake. except for Jake. <laughs> but here's the thing. Jake didn't really care. Jake wasn't there for the money. He was there for one thing and one thing only. We're going to be doing one thing and one thing only, killing Nazis. So Jake is now the lowest ranking person in his entire company and leadership was hoping that Jake would take this as a sign that he should start cooperating and right. get it together. That doesn't really happen though and leadership now has no idea what to do with Jake because <laughs> on one hand, he's way too valuable to lose but on the other hand, they don't want him mingling with all the other soldiers rubbing off on them in a bad way. So right. they take Jake, they stick him in his very own platoon all by himself and make him his own acting platoon sergeant. And then as time passes, whenever they get another soldier just like Jake, they would send him over to to join Jake's platoon, and he would eventually get four members in his platoon. Yo, he's just gonna have a platoon of like absolute crazy people. <laughs> yo, imagine being like in the army, bro, and they're like, yo, all right, so this is the platoon. You might wanna go if you're, you know, you're mental. You're probably gonna go into battle, just like lose it. Or you could go to the well-organized platoon, you know, know what I'm saying? But <laughs> yo, at least they got a platoon for that, that's cool counting him for a total of five, and they would become known as the Dirty Five. And Dirty from five. there, things would obviously get really out of hand. Fast forward, Jake and his men finish the first phase of their training, and they are given a pass to go out on the town one last time before they have to go to Fort Benning for airborne school. So right. Jake and his men, you know, his men that all outrank him because he's still technically a private, but he's also <laughs> somehow their platoon sergeant. They all go out, they go to the bar, they get drunk. They end up running into some MPs, one of his men starts lipping off to the MPs. The MP goes to beat him with a nightstick. Jake interferes and says, hey, he's really drunk, let it slide. In Jake's own words, and I quote, he's so drunk he couldn't hit the floor with his hat in 30 throws. Okay, so just <laughs> let it slide. He's gonna get his men back to the barracks. It's gonna be fine. The military police, the MP, then tells Jake, my- I was wondering what an MP was. Military, police, okay, okay. So you don't want to mess with them, right? And he's going to get his men back to the barracks. It's going to be fine. The military police, the MP, then tells Jake, mind his own business as he turns around to hit Jake's guy with a nightstick, at which point Jake proceeds to beat the shit out oh. of two MPs taking their Colt 45 1911s, firing all the ammunition into a nearby street sign before handing them back their empty guns and saying, okay, now you can take me to jail. The next morning, Jake's commanding officer shows up to the stockade to talk to Jake and he's like, look, not surprised you're here. Don't really care what happened. Here's the deal. The Japanese have the world record for the longest ruck march. And I want to break that record by having a group of guys march from here all the way to Fort Benning, 136 miles. And I think you and your men are some of the guys that are going to be able to pull it off. Right. And at which point McNeese is like 136 miles isn't a problem at all. I won't change my socks and I won't even get a blister, which if you've never been in the military and you've never ruck marched saying that you're not going to change your socks or get a blister on a 136 mile. Fuck. Oh, wait, they're doing it with all the equipment stuff on. What just so Ah, uh, yo, bro, 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 this guy. 80 pounds of gear on the march. Oh, yo. Saying that you're not going to change your socks or get a blister on a 136 mile fucking ruck march is an unprecedented amount of shit talking. It's like a NASCAR driver saying that he's going to win the Daytona 500 without having his tires changed a single time. <laughs> it's like going out drinking, ending up at Taco Bell at two in the morning, eating a bunch of steak quesadillas, waking up the next day, taking a shit and not wiping. Okay, it's just, <laughs> it's not possible. So then the commanding officer is like, great, cool. I'll see you at the ruck march. We're going to go ahead and leave you in the stockade for the next 10 days until then though jake's like cool no problem i'll hang out 10 days later shows up jake is in a prison uniform with a giant p on the front and three mps show up with 12 gauge shotguns loaded and they escort Jake to the starting line of this fucking ruck march like he's Hannibal Lecter. There, oh he changes God. into a normal uniform right. and takes off on a 136 mile ruck march to Fort Benning so he can go to airborne school. And sure enough, true to his word, Jake is one of only 75 men to finish this ruck march and he did not change his socks and he did not get a single blister, which I cannot stress to you enough 
is a superhuman feat. Who so is Jake this guy? Go on to do airborne training. Absolutely no problem. Nothing really of note happens here, except for the fact that Jake is still a private and has still not been promoted in any way. After completing airborne training, Jake and his men are going to go to Camp McCall, North Carolina, where they are to receive expert saboteur training. They'll be receiving extra training in demolitions. They'll be receiving training in how to drive tanks, how to drive bulldozers, how to drive excavators, how to drive trains, pretty much anything and everything they could teach these guys to be able to wreak havoc on enemy infrastructure right. is what they're learning in Camp McCall, North Carolina. Jake and his men continue to do what they do. They wreck every task that they're given. It goes perfect. Jake and his men are now about to go to England, at which point they are given one last pass to go out on the town one last time. Yo, who, bro, it's actually crazy how these guys are just smashing everything after everything. It, it, they are actual, like, you know how, like, we got heroes, like, superhero, uh, Superman and stuff? They are like them in the military, bro. They actually are. ...to go to England, at which point they are given one last pass to go out on the town uh -oh. one last time before they ship off. Uh -oh. So Jake and his men go out drinking. Somehow or another, they end up at this little tiny diner neighboring a train yard, at which point one of the trains pulls up stops oh, walks no. across all the other tracks and the conductors go in and they start eating at this diner jake they get a rubber drunk and he's like i don't want to walk back to the base i'm stealing that train and that's exactly what he does because the army just taught him how to drive trains no. so jake proceeds to steal a train and drive it all the way back to just outside of camp mccall where he abandons the train goes in and goes to bed but everybody knows jake did it nobody's turning him in so jake gets away with it Again, and now Jake and his men are off to England. So Jake and his men arrive in Yo, how do- Bro, who in the right mind steals a train, bro? Park it up and just go to bed. England. At this point, Jake has 13 men in his platoon, including himself. And they all come to the same exact conclusion. English food fucking sucks, <laughs> which is on par with every opinion of it I've ever heard. Hey! It seems weird to me because it's a country that took over most of the- Congo's half of the planet just for spices. Also, <laughs> first of all, I don't know what this is. And I don't know what this is, right? I do not what this is good with curry, not peas. And bees are toasted too bad. <laughs> Every opinion of it I've ever heard, which seems weird to me because it's a country that took over most of the known world for the sake of trading spices, and apparently nobody came to the conclusion that, hey, maybe you should put some on the food, but whatever. <laughs> because the food sucks, Jake decides, hey, I'm a master at hunting and fishing and all this other stuff. I'm just going to kill enough animals to feed my entire platoon by myself. And that's exactly what he does. The only difference is he has military grade equipment to do it. Jake is going out in the woods at night with a spotlight and an M1 Grand, and as soon as a set of eyes looks at him it's getting blown to smithereens jake has his men going out fishing with explosives okay what? they are eating everything couple of problems with that one there's strict water rationing going on the soldiers are only allowed to have one shower a week is how little water they have to spare so what? all 13 of his men come together and they decide hey we're just not going to take showers and we're going to use all of our water rations to clean and cook all of this game that we're killing and because now they started stinking they would all become known as the filthy 13. the other oh. problem with that was apparently all of the game was technically the property of the king and the only people that were allowed to hunt it were the lords and ladies of the land, which definitely was not Jake McNeese and the Filthy 13. So Sir Ernest Wells ends up figuring out what Jake's been doing. He gets super pissed, ends up suing the government for like $10,000 for all the animals that Jake and the Filthy 13 ate. The entire unit gets in a bunch of trouble and not Jake's kind of just like, meh. I mean, what, what are you going to do? I, I was hungry, so I ate some food. What do you want from me? If I'm in trouble, <laughs> go ahead and punish me. What are you going to do? Stick me in an airplane, make me jump out into enemy-held territory where a bunch of Germans are going to try to kill me? Joke's on you. I'm into that shit. <laughs> and the entire military is just kind of like, we, have, we literally have no way to punish him. So he gets away with it yet again. Fast you know what? I actually think punishing him would be to send him back home and like to kick him out of the military. You know what I'm saying? I, because he wants to do that stuff, bro. Before June 5th, 1944, the day before D-Day, Jake and the Filthy 13 are given a separate and extremely dangerous mission of going out, capturing and occupying an enemy-held bridge that's supposed to be able to help allied tanks penetrate further inland. After a day, they'll be reinforced from troops landing on Utah Beach. And if Jake can't capture and occupy the bridge, he is to blow it up so that the enemy can't use it for right. reinforcements. This mission is deemed extremely dangerous and borderline impossible, but leadership figures, if anybody can pull it off, it's going to be Jake 
and the Filthy 13, because let's face it, the entire command structure at this point in time is basically looking at Jake's platoon like a fragmentation grenade of fuckery and bad attitude <laughs> that they finally get to yeet at the enemy. So after receiving their mission, Jake yeet. and his men go out to start boarding the C-47s to take off at midnight to jump into Normandy, at which point Jake decides that he's going to whip out his straight razor and shave himself a mohawk. He tells everybody that he's part Choctaw Native American and he wants to honor that heritage. However, in reality, while he was part Choctaw, he had heard that Germany had a lice epidemic and wanted to go there with as little hair as possible. <laughs> Regardless, his men followed suit and all shaved mohawks. They then began donning black face paint, at which point Jake is like, this is cool, but we can make it cooler. So he goes over to the C-47 that had a fresh white stripe painted down the side of it to identify friend from foe, and the paint was still wet. So he runs his fingers through the paint and goes around painting all of his men's face with white face paint as well. Unbeknownst okay. to Jake and the Filthy 13, there were camera crews there taking pictures and recording them, and they would actually end up going viral, and the entire nation would be captivated by the unique and dangerous look of these men as they prepared to jump into enemy-held territory. So I ain't gonna lie. D is this actual footage? Because that's super cool if it is, right? They look badass, bro. They look... Like a group you do not want to mess with, man. So much so that it would actually inspire a movie to be made known as The Dirty Dozen, and Jake and his men would be none the wiser to any of it oh, wow. until after World War II. June 6, oh, 1944, wow. Jake, the Filthy 13, and 18,000 other paratroopers take off in C-47s as they prepare to jump behind enemy lines before the amphibious invasion at D-Day. About 20 miles from the targeted drop zone, Jake's plane gets hit with enemy flak fire and is losing altitude, and they have to bail out early. Moments after McNeese jumps out of the plane, the entire plane explodes, killing some of the Filthy 13 and scattering oh. the rest miles apart. So Jake lands, he's completely unharmed, and he has all of his equipment. The only problem is he doesn't have any other American anywhere near him right so he his just kind squad. of takes off he gets in a couple of long-range firefights with the germans takes a couple of them out in close quarters combat and he's just going around trying to find any other paratroopers to group up with and it's going on for hours and hours and he can't find anybody and he's starting to think maybe the whole thing was a catastrophe maybe it got called off maybe i'm the only guy out here right now what am i gonna do and he finally Yo. comes across one other american parrot imagine like being in that situation you can't find anyone you like in your head you're thinking what if you got called off and you're the only person? Yo. And it's a machine. What am I going to do? And he finally comes across one other American paratrooper. And it's a machine gunner that lost track of his machine gun during the jump. And this guy is running around Normandy with nothing but a belt of machine gun ammunition and no gun. And Jake <laughs> is like, Jesus. Okay, well, you're with me now, I guess. Here's my grenades. You take those. I'm going to keep my M1 Grand. Follow me. So now Jake and Grenade guys set off to find Grenade more paratroopers. Guy. So they keep looking, looking, they find some more. They find a squad of mortar guys. They find some guys over here, some guys over here. Slowly, Jake amasses an entire platoon of about 35 paratroopers. Okay. And they're all going to help Jake in his mission to take out this bridge. So Jake and his new companions start making their way to go blow up this bridge, at which point they would eventually come up on an entire American unit being led by this colonel. And the colonel is like, hey, you're working for me now. I don't care about that bridge. I need you to go pull security over on this part over here mcneese tried arguing with the colonel but the colonel wasn't having it he yeah yo bro jay's got a job man he gave a direct order and mcneese is like okay fine whatever i'll take my 35 guys and we'll go guard this for you so they take off headed there they get to the point they're supposed to guard and mcneese just keeps walking because it was the same direction as the bridge all of his men are like hey we're supposed to stop here <laughs> mcneese is like you do what you want i have to go take care of this bridge you can come with me i'd appreciate it if not Stay here and guard it. I really don't care. All of the <laughs> men go with Jake and proceed to make their way to this bridge. So I Jake is going to show up to the bridge. They capture it. They build up some fortified fighting positions because they now have to hold it for a day until reinforcements from Utah Beach can arrive. So the Germans start showing up. They fight the Germans back every time. One day passes, no reinforcements. Day two, they keep fighting the Germans back, holding the bridge, holding the bridge. No reinforcements show up. Day three, the Germans are now on the other end of the bridge with Jake and his men over here, and it is just no man's land in between on the actual oh, bridge. Oh, wow. When suddenly, an entire squadron of P-51 Mustangs comes up and blows up the entire bridge, because apparently the American leadership determined there's no way Jake was going to be successful in his mission, so they blew up the bridge anyways. Thankfully, Jake and his men would make it out okay. None of them were harmed in the blast from the P-51. Now, at this point, Jake decides, hey... We're going to continue to hold our position here because if anybody is going to try to cross this ravine, they're going to do it right here where the bridge used to be. Right. And sure enough, an entire German infantry battalion shows up on the other side of where this bridge was. At this point, the German officer... How big is a battalion? 
How big, I'm, I'm guessing big, right? And they've, they've got 35 guys. Officers make their way through the ravine and up to Jill's up on the other side of where this bridge was. At this point, the German officers make their way through the ravine and up to Jake under a white flag where they're like, hey, go ahead and surrender. We've got 700 men. You've got 35. It's going to be a bloodbath. Just call it a day. J 700! Oh, Jay, what are you going to do, Jake? Jay, what are you going to do, bro? Go ahead and surrender. We've got 700 men. You've got 35. It's going to be a bloodbath. Just call it a day. Jake, being Jake, is like, no, no, but you're welcome to surrender to me. The German <laughs> officer, thoroughly annoyed, is like, what are you doing in that mohawk head of yours? I have 700 men. You need to surrender or I'm going to kill all of you. At which point, I'm paraphrasing here, but I would assume Jake said something along the lines of, yeah, yeah, you've got 700 men, but you're going that way and the battlefield is that way, which tells me that all my buddies showed up on Utah Beach and they've been kicking your ass so bad that now you're trying to run away from them. So the way I figure Yo. it, you've got about three options. Option A, you surrender to me right here, right now, and you all live happily ever after option b you go back to your men you hold your position right where you're at and all my buddies show up in a little bit with a bunch of sherman tanks and proceed to un-german engineer all of you motherfuckers and option c <laughs> You guys try to fight your way through this ravine with me guarding it, which to be honest, I would recommend the least. I have the high ground, I have fortified machine gun positions, and you've got to make your way through a ravine first, meaning that I basically also have a moat. So I will <laughs> effectively be going medieval on your ass if you choose option C. Now, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but if I was you, I would pick option A, because if you pick option B or option C, I can pretty much guarantee that the next piece of officer correspondence that you're going to get is going to be from a fucking Ouija board. At this point, the German officer storms off with his hair on fire. There's he's no way he's trying to Jake then goes over to his men and he's like, hey, uh, get ready for a fight. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I just poked the bear. We'll see what happens. Sure enough, like an hour later, 700 German infantrymen proceed to take off and attempt to bum rush Jake and his men in their fortified fighting right. positions. Now, of course. I don't know what you know about military tactics, but generally speaking, it is a terrible idea to run face first into machine gun fire. It's also a terrible idea to try to fight the enemy when they have the high ground. If you right. Believe me, ask Anakin. But no, oh no, don't bring it to Anakin, man. But listen, they have 700 men. The only time I think it would be good to do all of that is if you got 700 men versus 30. You could outnumber them. But sure, man, sure, sure, sure. Oh, I love this but scene. running face first into a fortified machine gun position through a moat while they have the high ground and the men running the machine guns are under the command of some American with a mohawk Native American <laughs> face paint who everybody calls Jake McNasty is right. literally a lifetime supply worth of shitty ideas. Jake and his men would <laughs> hold their screwed. fire until the majority of the Germans made their way into the water, at which point they would open fire with four heavy crew served machine guns, two mortar tubes, and a bunch of small arms, effectively mowing down and decimating the entire German battalion. On that wow. day, Jake and his ragtag group of paratroopers were credited with removing 700 enemy combatants from the field. Shortly after that, the reinforcements from Utah Beach show up. Jake goes over to a small town. They get put in a holding position for a little while. Then Jake's small group of ragtag paratroopers all get evac where they get broken up and sent back to their original units where they get regrouped and refitted to return to war. Jake McNeese would find himself getting evac all the way back to France where he would be reunited with the five surviving members of the Filthy Third Team, oh, wow. as well as receiving a bunch of new recruits for his platoon. At this point, they had a couple weeks off where they could drink, relax, do whatever. Jake's going out, he's getting drunk, he's having a good time. Then he would receive word that his platoon is going to be partaking in a new airborne operation referred to as Operation Market Garden, the largest airborne operation in human history with 38,000 paratroopers jumping into Nazi-occupied Holland. Hearing that he was going to be jumping into Holland, Jake figured that he was going to be engaging in a lot of close quarters combat, right. so he opted to turn in his M1 Grand and get a Thompson, which is exactly what he did. He then received word that his platoon, being the bridge experts that they are, were going to have to go out capture a bunch of bridges, defend them, and or get rid of them until they heard word otherwise. Hey, look. Bro, he loves his bridges, man, don't he? He actually loves it. Bro, he, you know, if I was in the military, I actually, would I? See, I'm too, I'm too scared, you know what I mean? I'm not as brave as that. But if I was brave, I definitely would be a part of his bridge. Like, you know, if you want to go there and enjoy it, bro, it sounds like he's having a good time, man. I made a bridge. It only took me, like, what? 
10 seconds. And pretty much everything goes according to plan there. They jump in, they get to the bridge, they take the bridge over, they hold it for a couple of weeks. Then they receive word that they are to go help another unit take over this town known as Eindhoven. So Jake and his men make their way over to Eindhoven and they begin helping to clear out this town room by room, building by building, close quarters combat, them versus the Germans. In his book, Jake described this close quarter combat as very different from what you see today. It wasn't four troops stacked up outside a door, kicking it in and all running in together. It was one guy, one room. An American would kick open the door, throw in a frag grenade, as soon as the frag grenade blew up, the American would then crawl in on his hands and knees with a Thompson submachine gun and shoot anybody that survived. The what? reason they crawled in on their hands and knees is because according to Jake, the grenade would kick up so much dust and soot and debris in these old buildings that you couldn't see standing at normal level. So you oh, had to wow. drop down like you were in a fire trying to avoid carbon monoxide to be able to see what you were doing. And this is how they cleared the entire village. Maybe what? Is that, you know, because he was a fireman, is that like um, his fireman knowledge kicking in there? Bro, that's small. Taking their way all the way through it, about halfway through, Jake would be clearing a building where somebody clearly used to make furniture, at which point Jake would find a chicken. Now, this chicken had six eggs. Finding eggs in the middle of a war zone in World War II was a big deal. Right. Nobody had eggs, and Jake fucking loves eggs okay <laughs> this is amazing Only he's got about he's got to figure out how to get these six eggs all the way through this village without breaking them so he thinks for himself to a second maybe i could leave the eggs here and i'll come back for them later and he's like no that's not going to work because one of these other paratroopers is going to find my eggs and these are my eggs i want them. so he <laughs> takes all the eggs and sticks them in the cargo pocket of his pants and then every time he clears a room rather than crawling in on his arms and legs he slides in on one side <laughs> the side without the eggs to ensure that he doesn't damage any of his precious eggs yo imagine right <laughs> You're in the middle of a war zone. Your job is to clear buildings and you're altering the way that you do it to protect eggs, bro. Only Jake, man. Only Jake. Which is the most gangster shit I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> this dude is going toe to toe in close quarters combat against enemies with submachine guns trying to kill him. And his primary concern is not fucking up breakfast. This is like a That's stupid funny. video game achievement for when you want to play it on extra hardcore mode. <laughs> it's almost like this man knows that he has plot armor. It's absolutely incredible. So he continues to go on, clears out the entire village, doesn't wow. break a single egg. It's absolutely incredible. They get to the other side of the village they're like sweet we cleared out all the germans and then across the field out of the wood line pulls an entire german mechanized unit with 10 tanks at this point jake is like my eggs i just want to eat my fucking eggs <laughs> this sucks so jake and the filthy 13 go to work being the demolition men it's their job to go around to the tanks and disable their tracks so they can no longer move and then the infantry is going to come in with their flamethrowers and cook the enemy out and that's exactly what happens everything goes according to plan they take out all 10 tanks not really that big of a deal right. jake reaches into his pocket tragedy strikes he's broken a single egg it only took 10 german tanks to make this guy fumble enough to break <laughs> a single egg and he got to enjoy five eggs for dinner that night. Jake and his men would then this adopt a guy. holding position where they would chill out for a little bit, hold their position until they got evac'd again for yet another huge mission where Jake and his men would find themselves back in France for a second time. So Jake and his men find themselves at an army base right outside of Reims, France. Obviously, Jake and his men want to go drink in town, have a good time, of see course. if they can find some women, you know, what have you. The only problem is, apparently the 82nd Airborne was there last month, and the 82nd Airborne caused such an issue in town that the military had to bring in a special group of MPs to get the 82nd Airborne under control, and now all paratroopers have been effectively banned from town. I mean, to be fair, what? that's pretty on brand for the 82nd Airborne. Bunch of rowdy dudes. If you don't know, that's their logo. On paper, AA stands for All American, but everybody knows that it actually stands for Athletic Alcoholics. <laughs> What, are they really like that known to be that bad? Now, Jake, wanting to drink anyways, comes up with a plan. He's got to hook up with a distillery all the way over in Paris, which is like a two-day trip away. So, Jake gets a 72-hour pass, starts leaving to go to Paris. His commanding officer stops him and is like, Jake, what are you doing? I'm going to Paris to get some booze for the boys. Jake, <laughs> Paris is two days away. Do you really think that you're going to be able to take two days to travel to Paris, go on a week-long bender, and then travel two days back all in 72 hours? At which point, Jake looks at the- Oh, wait. All in 72. <laughs> officer and says, and I quote, I don't know. I wouldn't be willing to bet on it, but 
I'm willing to try. At which point the <laughs> officer kind of just rolls his eyes and is like, is there anything I can do to stop you? Jake, not really. So the officer just lets him go because he realizes that Jake's going no matter what. It's just a matter of if he wants to get his ass beat over it or not. So right. Jake makes his way to Paris, goes on a couple day bender, gets a bunch of booze for the boys, heads back to base. He finally gets back. He's been AWOL for five days. They immediately throw him yeah. in the stockade for abandoning his post, at which point Wait, his for five days. They immediately throw him in the stockade for abandoning his post, at which point... What does that mean? Throwing in the stockade? What, what, what does that mean? His command comes up to him and is like, Jake, we've been talking. We really want you to volunteer for Pathfinder School. At which point, Jake kind of has a little bit of a panic attack and he's like, they're trying to kill me. Like, they're actively trying to kill me. Wait, why, you see, if you don't know what a Pathfinder is, they're basically paratroopers, but they go out hours or a day before the big, huge paratrooper operation and they jump beforehand and then they figure out the best spots to drop all the other paratroopers and radio it back to base so they know where to put everybody. What? This job during World War II was incredibly dangerous. On a given airborne operation, it required two Pathfinders and one set of radio equipment to get the mission done. And on every mission, they would drop 10 Pathfinders and two sets of equipment because they knew that on average, eight of them were gonna die and one set of equipment was gonna be damaged or lost. They Wait, why would anyone want to do that job? Yo, shout out a massive respect to all of the Pathfinders. Because you need balls to do that job. They had a 80% fatality rate on any one mission at any point during World War II. What? And that is why Jake thought for sure they're trying to get me killed. The only silver lining here is they can't make him do it. Because Pathfinder is so dangerous that it was strictly a voluntary basis only. But uh... Jake wasn't one to act too quick, so he said he'd think about it. And he goes... Yo, okay, yo. Massive respect to anyone who volunteered to be a Pathfinder. That's crazy. And he thinks about it and he's thinking about the war and he starts to think to himself, you know, Pathfinder school is all the way over in England. By the time they send me there, I start school, I finish school. There's a good chance this war might be over altogether and I'm not gonna have to make another combat jump. It'll be great. So he's That's like risky, kind though. of on the fence about it now. And then he really starts thinking about it. And he's like, man, Pathfinder schools at an Air Force base. And even back in World War II, the Air Force had way better food than the Army. So <laughs> now he might not have to do any more combat jumps. And he's going to get some good food. <laughs> and then it dawns on him. The Air Force base where they teach Pathfinder school is eight miles down the road from Oxford University. And all the young British men are fighting a war right now. Meaning that Oxford is just full of college chicks. And as Jake said himself, and I quote, this seemed like a mighty fine opportunity to do some postgraduate work. <laughs> Fucking love this guy. <laughs> so Jake shows up to Pathfinder. You're telling me this guy has volunteered to do the riskiest job for some good food and some whip. Wait, you know what? Actually, World War II, that sounds good. <laughs> Under school and he's immediately called into the commander's office which is weird because he hasn't even done anything wrong yet jake goes in there the commander's like hi jake i've heard all about you i want you to be acting first sergeant at which point jake is like i don't know what you heard about me but you heard wrong i'm technically not even a private first class yet i've never been promoted i am not the leader that you want i don't care about saluting i don't care about any of that dog and pony show military stuff i'm here to fight a war and that's it at right. which point the commander's like that's exactly why i want you i don't need you to salute me i don't need you to call me sir i need you to get these guys ready for war and i don't think there's anybody better to do it than you i'll make sure that you end up getting paid as a first sergeant the entire time you're enacting first sergeant to which jake okay. replies i'm not i don't really care about the money look i've blown up every safe between here and <laughs> Normandy, I have plenty of money, okay? I might be willing to do this job, but if I'm gonna do it, there's gonna be some terms. Anybody that's fighting for me is gonna keep having good Air Force food and they get permanent leave whenever they want it. At that point, the commander agrees. Jake is now the acting first sergeant, which if you don't know, okay, is cool. the polar opposites of the spectrum as far as enlisted rank goes. So per usual, Jake excels at pretty much everything all through Pathfinder school. They graduate, Jake is still acting first sergeant, and he gets to decide which person is in which platoon. So naturally, Jake does what anybody would do, and he builds a dream team of the 20 best Pathfinders out of all 400 and puts himself with that platoon. Now at this point- Oh yes, yeah, smart guy. 
guy. Bro, if I was Jake, I would do the exact same as well, bro. It's really looking like Jake might never have to go out on a mission as a Pathfinder because the war is really dwindling down at this point. Right. Then, December 16th, 1944, the Germans would launch a last-ditch effort counteroffensive to try to fight Allied forces. This would be known as the Battle of the Bulge, where they would cut off the 101st Airborne, Jake's old division, inside the town of Bastogne, completely surround them, and the 101st Airborne is now stuck in this city. They are running out of ammunition, they're running out of food, Food, and they're running out of gas and if they end up surrendering it can turn the entire tide of world war ii oh wow so, all they need is they need somebody to be able to parachute in get in town and be able to call in resupply drops to let the 101st airborne have a fighting chance to be able to hold off the germans long enough for Patton to show up with his army of 350,000 men so you've got a crazy mission somebody needs to save the day you're calling upon jake and his dream team there hasn't been a single radio transmission to come out of the 101st Airborne in over two days. Despite that, Jake and his dream team are going to jump in anyways. They have to be able to hit a two mile diameter landing zone while jumping out of a plane that's traveling 160 miles an hour, utilizing parachutes that they can't steer. This mission is seemingly impossible. Yeah, that's mine. But here they go. They go, they jump out of the planes, they hit the landing zone perfectly. One man, unfortunately, does. Wait, if you can't steer the parachutes... Did they like collide with each other all the time and stuff like like bro wait, wait. Yo, that's scary, man. Where are you going to land? Realizing parachutes Random. that they can't steer. This mission is seemingly impossible, but here they go. They go, they jump out of the planes, they hit the landing zone perfectly. One man, unfortunately, does die, but that is a 5% fatality rate compared to the average of 80. Jake and his wow. men then immediately get to work setting up their equipment in opposite sides of town. And after one guy calls in one resupply, he picks up his stuff, moves to a different location. Then this guy calls in his resupply, picks up, moves to a different location, and they bounce the signal back and forth on opposite sides of town all day sending signals for resupply they okay. do this because they know the germans can triangulate their radio equipment and don't want them to start utilizing artillery to take them out within the first 24 hours of jake and his men landing they called in 247 c47s for resupply drops on the second day they were able to call in 160 on the third day they I... were able to call in 140 on... this sounds like a lot on the fourth day they were able to call in 269 and on the fifth day they were able to call in 129 jake and his men have single-handedly provided the 101st Airborne Division with enough resupply to be able to stave off the Germans to give Patton enough time to show up with his army and Mad. penetrate through the German flank, Mad. effectively ending World War II in the European theater and potentially saving the entire war as a whole. So Jake Wait, so Jake is like a ma Yo, this is crazy. He, bro, he's like literally a massive key pot part in the whole entire World War II. Bro, that's mad. Jake has effectively saved the day. It is now time to get out of there, get retooled, refitted, and probably never make another combat jump again because right. for sure the war is over this time, right? Wrong. Apparently, <laughs> Patton gets in some trouble, needs some hotshot pathfinders to jump into Prim, Germany, and call in resupply for him. So they're going to Jake and his crew yet again. Jake jumps in, saves the day for a fourth time, becoming one of the only men in history to conduct four combat jumps during World War II. At that point, the war is basically over and they adopt a holding position where they pretty much just party in Germany for the rest of the time. <laughs> now, as fate would have it, Jake and his men and some of the rest of the 101st Airborne would end up taking refuge in the abandoned castle of Hermann Göring, like one of the biggest Nazi leaders during World oh, War II. Wow. And oddly enough, a bunch of the spoils from all the countries that Germany has invaded all found their way to his castle. Fancy booze, fancy wine, and apparently he was a racehorse fan because every famous racehorse from every country that Germany invaded had made its way back to his castle. What? So Jake, the Filthy 13, a bunch of other 101st guys are sitting there getting drunk on fancy wine, fancy whiskey. Oh, they're loving life right now, bro. They are loving life. And there's like a hundred million dollars worth of racehorse sitting in the barn, at which point they're like, let's throw on a rodeo for all the townspeople, right? Right. And that's exactly what they do. So you've got a bunch of drunk paratroopers riding around all these fancy racehorses. It's a great time. And then my personal favorite part Bro, of this entire story, while out at the rodeo, Jake would meet an attractive young lady by the name of Amelia. And Jake and Amelia would immediately hit it off and start doing some postgraduate work. I mean, dating. <laughs> oh, don't worry, it gets better. As it would turn out, Amelia's father is the leader of the local chapter of Hitler's youth, which is just the absolute cherry on top to this entire story. Wait, 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 wait. It would turn out Amelia's father is the leader of the local chapter of Hitler's youth, which her father was the leader of the local chapter of Hitler's youth. What does that mean? It's just 
the absolute cherry on top to this entire story. How's this saying go? Screw you and the horse you rode in on. Jake's like, nah, I'm going to raid your liquor cabinet, steal your horse, ride in on it, and then bang your daughter. This is the best <laughs> possible ending to this man's epic saga in World War II that anybody could even come up with, and it happened in real life. Just to recap, Jake jumps into D-Day, Rex house. Then jumps into Holland, Rex house, and then eats some eggs about it. Then he pretty much single-handedly turned the tide of the Battle of the Bulge, and then this he proceeds to find the closest thing he can to a Nazi princess and show her that inches right. are in fact better than centimeters. <laughs> right, that's who she is. Yo, this is crazy, bro. Jake has literally lived a life, man. Shortly after that, Jake would get sent back home to America, where they would then reroute him to Arkansas so that he could see a plastic surgeon about getting his ear repaired because it had gotten mangled during one of his exploits. Uh, While in Arkansas, he would have a run-in with the military police, get in a fight with them, get thrown in the stockade course. yet again of before course. being released. The military police commander would inform him after he gets his ears fixed, they don't ever want to see him on their post again, at which point Jake, being Jake, informs the military police commander, hey, if you ever see me again, I'm going to be a civilian and you're going to be the one with the fucking problem because I'm going to kick your ass. At which point, <laughs> the military police commander files charges on Jake and Jake is immediately chaptered out of the U.S. Army, officially ending his military career after only three years, five months, and 26 days. Wait, 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 that was only three... He did all that in three years, five months. That was only three years? He did all of that. His military career after only three years, five months, and 26 what? days. What? Because that's just how it goes for the anti-heroes. They are absolutely necessary in a time of war and not tolerated whatsoever during a time of peace. Right. Jake didn't really mind, though. He had accomplished what he set out to do. Plus, he had a huge hoard of cash that he had liberated from all the safes that he ran across in Europe. At Wait, so he actually took the cash? Because I was going to ask that, you know, like if they find stuff, like he find the safes and stuff and he took it, he could actually keep that. Yeah. <laughs> time he goes on to explore his own alcoholism, going He's from chilling. place to place, town to town, job to job, just kind of doing his own thing. He ends up getting in a ton of bar fights, not because Jake instigates of course. Him, but because every local tough guy hears Jake's a paratrooper and they want to prove how tough they are. But ultimately, the only thing they proved is that they could fall down. Then after a number <laughs> of years, Jake would have a near miss with a drunk driving accident where he would almost drive his car into a concrete wall, in his own words, only missing it by a coat of paint. Because of that, Jake oh, wow. would decide that he needs to change his own ways. He would defeat his alcoholism. He would find God. He would start going to church every Sunday. He would find a wife. He would have some kids and he would live happily ever after working at the post office in his hometown of Ponca City, Oklahoma, selling stamps and slinging packages, and nobody was none the wiser that their friendly neighborhood mailman was one of, if not the greatest anti-hero of all time. So Man, that's giving me goosebumps right there, bro. Like, imagine, like, your local mailman is Jake. You just don't know all that, bro, and you don't, and you didn't know. In conclusion, it's hard to put into words what an anti-hero is, but you know it when you see it. However, the best definition I have ever heard comes from Jake McNasty McNeese himself. When asked in an interview later in life how he managed to survive all of his crazy exploits, he said, and I quote, I think I made it because God didn't have anywhere to put me. At that <laughs> point in time, he was so busy, he was only putting people in one of two places, heaven or hell. And I think he knew that I would have goofed up either one of them. So here I am. And I think that might be the closest thing to a perfect definition that we're ever going to get when it comes that to is. defining what an anti-hero is. That literally so, is. Thank you for watching. The best way to support the channel is to wow. the fat electrician .com. That was really Crack good, bang. man. Out. No, I enjoyed that a lot. Oh, wait, wait, we got some more clips. Hold on, hold on. The best way to support the channel is to go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack, bang, out. Well, I should retreat that evening and then went in town that night and got on a big drunk. The MPs was mistreating, really mistreating a soldier boy. I stepped in, told them to stop it, and they said, we'll do it any time we want to. So I took their nightsticks away from them, beat them to the ground. And then I took their 45s off of them and shot up all the street lights and everything around there. And I wasn't shooting at any people, I was just shooting lights. And then we right. went on in with them to the stockade. And I never did have to stand retreat again. <laughs> oh, he's an absolute legend, Jake Manasty. But no, a really good video. Enjoyed that. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed it as well. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. If you guys enjoyed, make sure you leave a thumbs up, subscribe for more content. I'm live every single day on Twitch.tv forward slash L3WG. If you guys want to check me out over there, I'll see you on the next one. Peace.